Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first event of 2022. My name is Beth Helfrich. I'm the events manager here at Main Street Books. Um, I would not have predicted that we would be in our third calendar year of virtual events, but we are grateful for the ways in which Zoom and its counterparts have allowed us to keep gathering together around wonderful books and their fascinating, brilliant, charming, accomplished writers, one of whom is here with us tonight. What a treat to kick off our event season with the one and only Diane Chamberlain. I will introduce her momentarily, but first a few housekeeping tips. Number one, please do remember to stay on mute. This is a Zoom meeting, not a webinar. So you are welcome to keep your video on, um, but do keep that mute button hit uh, with the red um, line through it. If you have questions that pop up during the conversation, which I'm sure you will, um, please feel free to post those into the chat. Um, I will bring those forward throughout the event as they come up. Um, and if we have a plethora of questions, then we'll set aside some time um, after the bulk of the conversation to make sure we can hit those as well. Um, we are orchestrating a virtual signing line via breakout room tonight, which is one of my favorite things we can do through modern technology. Um, this means if you've purchased a copy of The Last House on the Street for Main Street Books, then later tonight, you'll have the opportunity to chat with Diane briefly one-on-one -on -one as she personalizes a book plate for you. She'll then send those to us and we'll make sure that your book plate gets put into your book um, before you either pick it up or we ship it to you. So please, I encourage you, if you have not already purchased a copy, I will post that link into the chat and um, you can click, click, click and have your chance to chat with Diane. Um, a few more folks coming in. Okay. Um, we have hosted many, many virtual events in the last two years, but we are also celebrating a first tonight because Diane is actually joined by her audiobook narrator, Susan Bennett. I listened to The Last House on the Street, and so I am delighted to welcome Susan, and I'm going to introduce her first. Susan is an award-winning actress, narrator, and writer who has been recording audiobooks for over 15 years. She's won several Earphones Award from Audiophile Magazine and has been nominated for numerous Audi and Sova Awards for her work. She has also written and recorded her own original audio serial called Lucinda, which is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and on her website, which is susanbennett.me. Susan considers it a great privilege to be able to voice many of Diane Chamberlain's books, including her latest, That Last House on the Street. And she's also grateful to you and for all of the book and audiobook lovers who are here tonight. So first, welcome, Susan. Hi, everybody. How are you? It's so lovely to see all of you. It is just, Beth, thank you so much for having me. And Diane, I am just thrilled to be in your presence. Um, I feel like I've known you in your imagination and now to know you a little bit in the flesh is virtual flesh, though it may be, is really wonderful. And it's just thrilling to be here. And thank you all for coming. It's so lovely to see you. And thank you for joining us from your studio in Brooklyn, North Carolina, or B Brooklyn, New York. Was yes, it? yes. And now, of course, our featured guest, Diane Chamberlain. Diane is a lifelong reader who then picked up a pad and paper and pen during a long wait at the doctor's office, thankfully, and she started writing. Here we are 28 novels later. This New York Times bestselling author is still writing much to the delight of her many fans and readers. Propulsive and humane both, Diane's books have swept up, carried away, and touched the hearts of so many readers. And her latest, The Last House on the Street, is no exception. Diane is originally from Plainfield, New Jersey, but her adopted home is right here in North Carolina, where she lives with her partner, John, who is a photographer and filmmaker, and their pup, Cole. Diane, we are so honored to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Beth. I'm delighted to be here and especially delighted to finally meet Susan. I always feel like Susan and I are this team, and yet we have never met before, so this is really cool. That is very cool, and we are so happy to be orchestrating it. Um, Diane, if you don't mind just starting us off, the book came out yesterday. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Without giving any spoilers, you know, I'm going to try very hard to avoid those tonight, but can you just give those of us here tonight a quick teaser or your sort of quick elevator pitch of what's this one about? 
It's a dual, dual timeline, 1965 and 2010. It's two young women who are both living on the same street, but a whole bunch of, of years apart. And the things that happen on that street have a huge impact on both of them. That is uh, well put. Um, and you ha lived through both of those times. So the first time is 1965. The second timeline is 2010. Why do you think this story emerged from, for you um, now in 2022? I mean, you know, that's a really good question because um, this issue of civil rights has been on my mind since I was a young teenager. And uh, I grew up in a town that was at that time about half black. And so it was unavoidable. You had to think about race and you had to think about um, why some people didn't have as much money as you and why some people were automatically put in uh, classes that were intellectually lower than you. It was just really impossible to grow up there without thinking about racial issues. So it's always been a part of who I am. And I think with the tenor of the times moving toward um, fewer racial, fewer voting rights based on race, uh, it really, it was just really uh, important to me to address that in some way and make it entertaining at the same time. I appreciate that. And I did um, actually read through your acknowledgements um, where you talk a lot about um, writing this, writing about race in the South um, as a white woman. And you talk a little bit about your research and specifically um, your reading of and then your, your work with a woman who actually um, was a part of the civil rights movement. Can you talk, us a little, talk to us a little bit about the research um, and your process? Yeah, yeah um, I had read about SCOPE when I was a teenager, actually. Uh, and it was just a few years after the SCOPE program came about. And for those of you who don't know, um, the book, in the book, my character Ellie in 1965 joins a, a youth program where in which she's a white woman, in which white students, college students, um, come into the South and try to help black residents register to vote because it was very, very difficult back then. There were intimidations and literacy, literacy tests and all kinds of ways that, all kinds of stumbling blocks to keep them from voting. So um, I was very interested in this SCOPE program. And so I began my research by seeing what was on the internet and there was very little about it, but I did stumble across a book written by a woman named Maria Gittin and I contacted her and she was enormously gracious and helpful. And I read the book, of course, I devoured the book and have every page practically earmarked. And she, um, she was very honest in her telling of her experience. She was 19 years old. And the thing that struck me was no matter how incredibly motivated a 19 year old is to do the right thing, you're still 19 and you kind of screw up. So there is a real sense as I read the story that, that these teenagers uh, and young 20 year olds um, really tried their best and yet, oh, there's a party and maybe we should go check out this party. So of course that comes about in my story too. Uh, it really helped me see what it would be, what life was like for these young kids to come into the South and with really good hearts do the kind of work that they wanted to do, but still remain teenagers. 
And, and where did the choice to set this, um, that narrative against the 2010 narrative where you have another woman there, they are, you, you realize that their paths are connected, of course, but um, a young widow who um, is moving into this beautiful home with her daughter um, and mysterious things are happening and, and there's certainly suspense there, but where, where did that story come from and how did you decide to weave those two together? Well, I'm going to give you the honest answer, which is that when I was trying to decide what to write about, um, I had two ideas in my mind. And one was uh, a young woman, Ellie, joins the scope program and moves into an area where she can try to register Black voters. The other story idea was a young woman is in her office and another woman comes in who's very strange and starts making threatening comments to her about wanting to murder somebody and, and just other threatening comments. So I couldn't decide between these two ideas and I decided what if I squish them together and figure out how they fit. And so that's, that is tremendous fun for me to do something like that. So I really had a good time. Um, and it's also why as a reader, you're gonna go, what? I do not get how these stories come together. But then there's this kind of magical way that they do come together, I hope. <laughs> yes, I can attest. It does happen to great, to great satisfaction. Um, that time span and the fact that there are characters without, again, without spoilers that move back and forth um, or exist in both time spans. Um, this is gonna become a question for Susan, I think, means that um, you've got to be thoughtful about how someone's voice changes over 45 years. Mm. Um, both the voice in your writing, Diane, but also Susan in your performance. Um, I'd love for both of you to speak to how you how you capture a character's voice um, at 20 and then again at 65? Mm, what a good question. Go. Um, for me, it was just a matter of putting myself inside that person and remembering what I was like at 20. And now it's much easier for me to imagine 65. Um, so, but that is a really good question. I always think in terms of the difficulty of these two individual voices, Ellie and Kayla, um, and how to keep their voices separate. And the way I do it is to write one story first and then the other story second so that I have them um, clearly separated in my mind. But I'd love to hear from Susan how Susan is just remarkable at differentiating between characters. And I would love to hear how you do that, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. That's such a wonderful compliment from you. And um, I have to say that I always, I, it's always a tremendous privilege to read your books for this reason, because I feel that the characters are, are always drawn very authentically. And even if I don't necessarily have a frame of reference for a particular character, they come across so clearly on the page that I'm able to take what you're giving me and marry it with my imagination of a person like this person um, and come up with something that is always very coherent and that, that holds together over the course of you know 400 pages, which or 350 or whatever the book, this particular book is. Um, but you know, it is the challenge, it is the challenge of the narrator to um, embody the characters through your voice. And um, I, it's so interesting to get to know you a little bit, Diane, because um, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and there's definitely the same sort of racial mix that you were talking about. and one of the things that I admire and enjoy tremendously about voicing uh, these characters is that it is simply kind of written into their cells, how they are, they understand that they're a product of a country that has a very deep divide um, between 
to it, its largest swaths of citizenry, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that I come to it with that understanding and with that sensitivity. And so when I get into the head of a character and to speak specifically to like the generational thing that you're talking about, like the difference between a 65 year old character and a 20 year old character. So I know what it's like to be 20. Um, I don't yet know what it's like to be 65, but I can certainly understand the difference that 20 years makes. And I also remember being that young person who thinks they're inventing all of these things that, <laughs> you know, we think we're inventing recognizing that we have privileges and we're inventing uh, wanting to help our fellow man and we're inventing um, recognition of these these uh, injustices and we're going to change them and we have all we have this we have the naivete to which gives us the courage <laughs> to tackle them and I and I honor I try to honor that and honor the person that I know I was at the same time and as far as a 65 year old person goes I feel that I'm 47 and I know so much more at 47 than I knew at 20 so obviously I I take that imaginative leap and go where Diane has written the character and use the understanding of the change in a person over the course of 20 years. Even if I haven't lived to 65, I do understand how things get deeper and you get softer and you become much more vulnerable in, in so many ways. So I hope that um, question. I love that you used deeper and softer. Um, and since you've talked a little bit about vocalizing. Could you please um, do us the favor and read a passage? I would love to. I would love to. <clears throat> um, so Diane, I chose um, chapter nine, the opening of chapter nine, which is an Ellie chapter. And uh, there are no spoilers in here, um, but I do hope that uh, it sparks everyone's imagination about the book. Chapter nine. My parents were surprised to see me, and I made up some excuse for coming home, too nervous to tell them about scope right away. I was afraid they'd say no, and that would be the end of my dream for the summer. At dinner Saturday night, I finally got my courage up. I waited for a lull in the conversation between Daddy and Buddy about the work Buddy was doing on a neighbor's tractor. And then, before I lost my nerve, I blurted out, I've decided to do volunteer work this summer. For a moment, no one said anything. From across the table, I felt Buddy stiffen, his eyes on his fried chicken leg. He knew where I was going with this. Then Daddy turned to me. That's good, Ellie, he said. Volunteer work will look good on your application to graduate school. You still need to give your father some hours in the pharmacy though, Mama said. It sounded like a warning. I licked my dry lips, but before I could figure out how to respond, Daddy spoke again. What's the volunteer work, sugar? He sounded calmer than my mother, more willing to listen. Remember that article you read about scope? I asked. The white students helping to register people to vote? The three of them were silent. I felt my parents' eyes on me, and Buddy shot me a look across the table that I couldn't read, but imagined said, there is no way in holy hell they're gonna let you do this. You're not thinking of volunteering with them, are you? Mama asked. I nodded. Yes, I've already spoken to the minister about it, the one who was quoted in that article. I can probably work right here in Derby County. This is all ill-advised, Eleanor, Daddy said in the calm voice he'd used my entire life when he was laying down the law. You'll only be asking for trouble if you try to help out with that sort of thing. No one wants that program here, not the white folks, not the colored folks. They're fine with the way things are. So how could they possibly be fine with things the way they are, I asked. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. That is so awesome. Thank you. It's almost spooky 
I listened watch. to <laughs> I listened to um, to you narrate this book on my walks, mm-hmm. and it was just so good. But watching you is it's astonishing to me um, that you just slip into Daddy's voice and slip into Buddy's voice, and it's it's quite a skill. Thank you. Well, and they're there on the page. That's the thing is they're just, I hear those voices in my imagination. You know, I hear them and I mean, I have this family. I have, I mean, Beth, you were talking earlier about your, where your, your store is. I have family in Murphy, North Carolina, which is very close to Tennessee. And their family name is Murphy. So that's like, that's the bedrock of their whole clan, you know, is right there. And so anyway, I just, it's always a pleasure because it's not hard work for me to just call up those people that I, that I heard my whole life. You know. I'm curious, do you, you read the book first mm-hmm. yes. and then can you just read it once and then do it? Or do you need to take notes or how, what do you, what do you do to prepare? So occasionally I will read a book more than once if it's particularly Byzantine, you know, if it has a lot of twists and turns and um, a complex structure that requires me to, to understand where I am in a given time if the book is like chopped up in different timelines or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, for some, and I do, I keep a running list of like things I wanna investigate like places place names, like first thing is pronunciation. And then I'll try to get, I'll do some research about the flavor of a place, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's so interesting. You can call up the website for a college that would be like in Davidson, North Carolina, and you can see where the students would, where they would live and the tone of like the edu- the informational video would be a certain way, you know, and they would highlight what you can learn there. And um, you can learn a lot from the geography of a place. So I try to figure out like, are these mountain people? Are they city people, town people? Um, and all of that's usually very clear in your work, you know, where, where the people um, are coming from. And then I try to give myself at least a week's lead time. That's not always possible given the amount of work that I'm fortunate enough to have, but something sinks in for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, so Mm -hmm. if I've read a book a week ago and I'm going back to look at, you know, if I've done some research over the week and then I sit down to record it, things have sort of settled in, in in a nice way. So I don't feel so raw or kind of like I'm grasping, you know what I mean? So, and then I had many years acting experience. I did a lot of the, you know, a lot of stage work. So I understand that spontaneity is important. So I try not to overwork something, you know, or, you know, have a preset notion of what's going to happen. Cause it's, if you can live in the, in the, live in the, narration it's always comes across in the recording yeah that's a really good point yeah yeah and as I say I mean this particular book is just so those two timelines I mean when I began reading them I'm like gosh I have no idea how she's going to put all of this together (laughs) um but it works and it and it's it is a picture of how things have changed you know like it's a real it gives you this very potent sort of symbol as you're going back to the 1965 sections to work with in your mind, like, but we have this modern, this modern woman, Mm -hmm. this modern, you know, how she's dealing with her, what's happened to her and what the place is like now. And it's very interesting to kind of, it's interesting to have that in your, in your imagination when you're reading something as a reader. And I find it interesting too, as a narrator, it does something wonderful for your voice and for your understanding, you know? So much more goes into the narration than just narrating. For, for me, yes, definitely. And for, for most narrators, I mean, you're giving a performance like in a little room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, it's fun, it's fun. It's a, it's a great use of my time. So. 
And Susan, how, how, when you were actually doing the performance, which mm -hmm. I love calling it that, um, what, what is that experience like? How long does it take? Um, how many takes or, or, you know, what is that, that Thank work you. like? So that work, um, for example, for a book like this, um, I, it will take me between four and five days to record the book. Um, Diane writes these very well-researched and really accomplished, uh, complicated narratives, and they're generally about 400 pages, between three, 25, 400 pages. And so I know that, that, that a book that length will probably be four or five days, and I'll spend perhaps six hours in the studio on a given day, and I aim to record about 20 pages an hour. Um, and that that's a moving target sometimes, depending on if you're tired, if you're under the weather, if something's particularly emotional, you know, where you have to kind of be so vulnerable that it's hard to maintain your flow a little bit. Um, and it can be a it's a real workout, you know, it is not I, it's not I've gotten to the point where I can do it but it's always challenging and it's always, um, I always feel like it's a real accomplishment on the last day when we read the last page and whoo, you take that deep breath, like, yeah, we got it, we did it. Um, I'm lucky enough too that I am, because Diane's work, she's so treasured as an author and her books are so so eagerly anticipated that I get to work with a uh, an engineer who may also be a director. Um, and that is a privilege these days. I mean, it, when I first started, that was the standard. Now there's a lot of self-recording, but for Diane, I go into a studio and I work with another person and that is that just makes it all the more enjoyable because you're in, the, you're in it with someone. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to tell you, Diane, that I, I every time I record one of your books, the engineer is like reading ahead the night after we record because they want to know what's happening. <laughs> they are determined to like read this, they get hooked. <laughs> and so they read ahead and they're like, what happens? And I'm like, I'm not gonna tell you, you're gonna have to read it tonight. And they, and they do, they go home and they read the book and come in like, oh my God, that scene where they go to that party. Oh my God. <laughs> so you should know you've, you've made some fans along the way. That's interesting. Yes. So then does the director suggest how you should handle a scene? Um, for th so I, again, I'm fortunate because I have, I have experience with your work and I feel like I'm trusted to handle the acting part piece of things. So for this particular book and, and I feel like for, for almost all the titles that I have done after The Silent Sister, which was the title, I probably did that, what's it been, maybe 10 years ago. Um, wow. Or, or maybe not that long, but so I had a director proper for that, a wonderful man um, who uh, is, you know, really wonderful, he, great professional. And he definitely had a lot of ideas about, and pretending to dance too, the same, um, his name is Robert Kessler and he's in Katona, New York. And he had a lot of really wonderful observations about the characters in those books, which were very helpful to me. Um, but, so, but with this one, you know, I work with an engineer whose job is mainly to make me sound good and to keep us on track. But they enjoy it so much and he, you know, they become so involved in it that I feel confident saying, how are, how are we doing? Are we getting the same level of emotional investment today that we had yesterday? Are you following this thread, which is real, which is woven in here very subtly, that's going to have this big payoff. Um, so yeah, it's a real, it's a collaboration to, and there are different degrees and in, of involvement on, on your books for sure. Diane, can I ask a question um, about um, have there ever been moments or are there are there interpretations or, or portions of any of Susan's readings that either surprised you or um, 
do the voices in your head as you're writing, is she um, largely uh, capturing those? Um, and, or are there, are there any that have, yeah, have, have any of them surprised you, I would say, I guess, in her performance? Um, I think all the time, because even though I, I hear, I hear these voices in my head, um, they sound different and they, of course, they have her interpretation. And I can't think of any time when I've thought, oh, I don't like how she's doing this. The thing that stands out to me is a lot of times there'll be a sentence that, you know, I've read it 5 million times in my book as I'm working on it. And I have the inflections in a certain uh, way, you know, the words fit together in a certain way, and she will read them in a different way. And it's always stops me. And then I usually think, oh, I like the way she did that. <laughs> and so it, it shifts the way I think about it. But that's, that's the most interesting thing. The, and the last word, the last sentence of this book, which I won't say, um, you say it differently than I thought it. And I really like how you did it. <laughs> so I'm glad you're the one who's doing the narration and not I'm me. Rel I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very relieved to hear that. Um, Diane, Susan spoke about, um, you know, hitting parts that take longer because of the emotional vulnerability or the way it's landing. Um, did you... Uh, was that a challenge in the writing of this particular novel? Yeah, um, because it's a subject that I feel so deeply and I get angry about, I had to really work with my own emotions to um, pull them back so that they didn't interfere with the story or with the characters because not all the characters are me. And I have to remember that, that they are their, their own selves um, so that's part of it. And also this book has a lot of emotional pain in it. And so that, um, that can get really rough. I, I'm much better at it now with book 28 than I was with book one. With book one, I remember feeling like literal pain in my arms and in my chest. And um, when I look back at that book now, I'm like, really? But... <laughs> But I don't get that kind of visceral feeling anymore. But I do, I do feel the agony that the character is going through in, in more of a, um, an intellectual way. Um, there was something I was going to add to that. Oh, I don't know. It'll come to me and I'll let you know. And were there any really sticky points? Again, I don't want you to give anything away, but um, in, in, the puzzle of fitting these two stories together. Um, were there any particular parts that took extra gymnastics or as you were going, did it, did it, um, did the pieces fall into place? Um, you know, a lot of times they do magically fall into place. Uh, and what I think about is how my characters, um, know where they're going, even when I don't. Um, I like to say that I let my characters be my guide and not really push them too hard into my story, not be rigid about what I have on my, my big board when I have all my scenes spelled out, not to be too rigid about that because as you get rolling, your characters start to uh, have a mind of their own, actually from the first page, they have a mind of their own. And I think it's my subconscious at work, but they start doing things that I wasn't expecting. And it's better than what I had on my, you know, my board full of scenes. And I thought of what, what I was going to answer a minute ago with the emotional element and the pain with this book, without giving anything away, I talked to my editor about, she knew where I was going with the story and I talked to her about changing it because I couldn't stand it. <laughs> but don't let me put any of you readers off. <laughs> uh, it just was, it was really um, a tough part of the book. 
And she really worked through it with me, you know, helped me see that I had to um, stick with my original plan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and she was absolutely right. But yeah, so I tried to wimp out on that one. <laughs> tried, to, tried to find another way. Um, I'm glad she held you to the fire. It was good. That was, it was good payoff. Um, okay. We have one question that came through from the audience. And, um, this question is from Corey. Um, and you, we, we did start by talking about the research that went into this book. Um, but Corey is especially curious to know when you started working on the story, um, if it was before or after the summer of 2020, when, um, you know, issues of race, of course, emerged to the forefront in America. Mm -hmm. Um, She also adds that she's only on chapter five of the book and just loves the characters' relationships, especially between Ellie and her aunt. Um, She loves it when the aunt um, tells her to keep talking to her even after she's gone. Mm. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, I would say it was probably around that time uh, that I started thinking about this story. And as I said, scope had al- always been in the back of my mind as something to explore. And um, I was getting angrier and angrier at what's happening in our country with regard to race. So uh, the story just began to emerge for me. And um, Aunt Carol, I didn't have her in the story at first. And Ellie is raised as a Southern, young Southern woman. And why would she be so different from her friends? Why would she want, be so motivated to help black people register to vote? Uh, So that's when I came up with Aunt Carol. I wanted her to have, Aunt Carol was from New York and had very, radical ideas for her time. And I think she need, I think that Ellie needed to have that influence. And then of course there is another reason that you don't learn of till later that is motivating her. And one of the things um, we did when, when I was done with the book, my editor said that she, I used the real language of the day and referring to black people. Um, I used colored, I used the N word where I knew a character would use the N word. And um, my editor wasn't having any of it. She wanted me to use black all the way through, but in 1965, that simply would not have been the word. So um, I asked if we could get a sensitivity reader and St. Martin's hired a sensitivity reader uh, who was a, a black writer. And she read the whole book. And to my relief, she really said it was right on as far as the, the time period and the attitudes, et cetera. But she also felt um, that it's best if I left the N word out, so I did. Uh, and she, she really would have liked if I could have used the word black throughout, but I just did not feel that it was true at all to the time. So what I do in the book, um, those of you who have read it will recognize this and I'm not giving anything away. A young man who is um, central to the story is on the cusp of the black power movement, which really was just in its infancy at the time. And so he has that word in his mind and he uses it. And Ellie then picks it up from him. So then the second half of the book, that word is used much more freely. But I'll tell you, it really was hard writing a scene with the clan and the head of the clan, Bob Jones, saying colored, because it's just not, realistic. And yet I felt like that's what I needed to do. My um, sensitivity reader also suggested a trigger warning at the beginning of this book. 
And I, I'm really curious to know how people feel about that. Um, my editor and I decided against it, that if it, if it were a young adult book, looking at these kinds of topic, a tr trigger warning would make sense. But for an adult novel, we felt that it um, was not necessary. It's such an interesting um, glimpse into the, the process. Um, and, and when you're writing about issues um, of race and, and deeply um, sensitive issues, uh, the conversations along the way um, are really important. And so thanks for sharing what that process was like. Um, we have another audience question. This one's from Caitlin. Um, do you see, do you feel a sense of relief when you finish writing a book or is there a sense of mourning for these characters you've spent so much intimate time with that you won't get to talk to anymore every day? And I guess that's also a question for you, Susan, as you're recording, do you, is there, with that breath of relief, is there also some grief? For me, with my very first novel, I, I took so many years to write it that when I was done, I did feel a profound loss. Uh, where did my people go? I, I remember walking into my office and, and thinking to myself, they're gone. But I don't feel that way anymore. I think, oh my gosh, let me get this to my editor right now. Uh, so now I feel more joy than sorrow. What about you, Susan? Um, for me, it, it definitely depends on the book. Um, the for this particular book, it was definitely difficult to uh, to let go. Um, there's a lot of um, investment on a different level than I even realize sometimes. So some books stick with you, and I I really credit Diane for taking on these very difficult topics because they're emotional to begin with. And when you embody, you know, you embody these issues in, in the flesh of these real people, um, it, you can't help but be affected by it and moved by it and hopefully changed by it. And um, so, yeah, it is difficult sometimes to let go of a book. Sometimes it's a relief, you know, cause you've been through something. So, um, but as again, there's so much in the book and in Diane's work in particular that you will have some, you'll need to separate from it in some way when you're done, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we have time for a couple of more audience questions before we get started with our breakout room signing line. But as you all are formulating those questions and typing them in, I'm gonna ask both of you a question I ask of everyone who joins us at Main Street Books, which is, what are you reading right now that you love? Um, I'm reading The Maid and it's really refreshing. You know, it's not, I usually read heavy stuff and this is um, at least so far, I'm about a third of the way through, uh, a light mystery with a wonderful main character. So I'm really enjoying it. Wonderful. And Susan, do you get to have any choice over your reading? <laughs> I do. I do. Um, and I'm an avid reader, um, out, even outside of the work that I do. And I have um, one of my favorite books that I go back to all the time is a collection of Alice Munro's sh short stories called Family Furnishings. And it, it's like just it's such an incredible uh, collection of only a portion of her work. Um, and it, remi it, it reminds me of how detailed I would like to be in my, in all of my own art, you know, like all of my own artistic expressions and how much I want to engage with my imagination and how much I want to always be really observing instead of like judging everything. And um, the other book that I'm reading is called My First 30 Years, which is by this woman named Gertrude Beasley, um, who is a Southern woman who was kind of a truth teller in her family. Her memoir is one of these like hidden, um, almost mythologized works that 
came into being like this, like was unearthed at a given time and then was disappeared because it was too controversial. And she actually ended up in a mental institution. And this was like the, the sole remaining sort of vestige of her life. And she, Diane, I think you might enjoy reading it because it deals with uh, Southern agrarian people, very large family, and she's sort of like the truth teller in this family. And um, it's really one of the few books that I've ever read and like seen a lot of my family in it, you know, <laughs> um, which is not something I'm like happy about. <laughs> but yes, those are the, the, I do get to read and that's what I'm currently reading. So. Did you say that was called My First 30 Years? My first 30 years, and it's a first person narrative by a woman named Gertrude Beasley. Okay. I just, I jotted down those titles. Um, and um, Diane, if you could tell us, what is it that you are currently working on? What's next? I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> As usual, I'm playing with a variety of ideas and maybe I'll mix two of them together and see what happens. Yes. And I'm sure Susan will be at the ready for whatever magic arises. Absolutely. I hope so. Absolutely. It's always my pleasure and great honor. So thank you. Um, well, folks, thank you all so much for being here. We are going to go ahead and get started on our breakout room signing line. Um, the way that this will work is I am going to put Diane in a breakout room if you would love to stick around and say hello to her one-on-one, -on -one, um, I will move you in and out one at a time. Um, I'll be in the breakout room with Diane, um, and then the rest of you can hang here in the main room. I'll pull you in one at a time um, for a quick, quick meet and greet. Um, Susan, you're welcome to stick around, but you're also welcome to take off. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank Susan, you. Susan, thank you so much. It was just great. Thank you, Diane, and best of luck with the book. It is so wonderful. And Beth, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a great You're night. welcome. And Susan's recording truly is masterful. It's, um, it, it, it really uh, does the story more than justice. Um, I did put a link to where you can order the audiobook through our partners at Libro FM, which does support Main Street Books when you purchase through Libro. So um, I encourage you, that's how I read it and um, I loved it. So thanks, Susan.